Good evening, I'm Alma Angeles. Welcome to Eagle News International on tonight's headlines. Ukrainian soldiers repulsed the Russian attack in the capital, the military say, only hours after President Zelensky warned that Moscow would attempt to take Kiev before dawn. And Ukrainian President videotaped himself in Kiev as Russian forces closed in on the capital, vowing to fight them to the end. And Russia has expected vetoes a UN Security Council resolution that deplored in the strongest terms the country's aggression against Ukraine and demanded the immediate withdrawal of its troops. Huge downpours unleashed decades high floods in eastern Australia, killing two people overnight as the rising waters inundated homes, roads and swept away cars. First in our news, Ukrainian soldiers repulsed a Russian attack in the capital, the military said early Saturday, only hours after President Volodymyr Zelensky warned that Moscow would attempt to take Kiev before dawn. Russian President Vladimir Putin called on the Ukrainian army to overthrow the government whose leaders he described as terrorists and a gang of drug addicts and neo-Nazis. Take a look. Еще раз обращаюсь к военнослужащим вооруженных сил Украины. Не позволяйте неонацистам и бендеровцам использовать ваших детей, ваших жен и стариков в качестве живого щита. Берите власть в свои руки. Похоже, нам с вами будет легче договориться, чем с этой шайкой наркоманов и неонацистов, которая засила в Киеве. И взяла в заложники весь украинский. 24 февраля вооруженными силами Российской Федерации проведена успешная операция по высадке десанта в районе аэродрома Гостомель в пригороде Киева. В операции было задействовано более 200 российских вертолетов. Успех десанта был обеспечен подавлением всей системы ПО в районе высадки, полной изоляцией района боевых действий с воздуха и активным ведением радиоэлектронной борьбы. При захвате аэродрома было уничтожено более 200 националистов из состава специальных подразделений Украины. Потерь в вооруженных силах России нет. В настоящее время основные силы воздушно-десантных войск соединились с подразделениями российского десанта на аэродроме Гастамель, тем самым обеспечив блокирование города Киева с запада. Подразделения вооруженных сил России продолжают выполнение задач в районе Киева и других. President Putin unleashed a full-scale invasion on Thursday that has killed dozens of people, forced more than 50,000 to flee Ukraine in just 48 hours and sparked fears of a new COVID war in Europe. Putin, who ordered Russian troops to invade Ukraine, claimed that Ukrainian nationalists were preparing to deploy multiple, multiple rocket launchers to residential areas of Ukrainian cities, including Kiev and the northeastern city of Kharkiv. Ukraine's defense ministry said two enemy targets were shot down, identifying them as a Russian Su-25 helicopter and a military bomber near the separatist zone in the east. The Ukrainian Defense Ministry said 2,800 Russian soldiers had been killed without providing evidence. Moscow has yet to report on casualties. Ukraine's President Zelensky urged the nation to defend itself. Всім доброго ранку, українці. Зараз в мережі дуже багато з'явилось фейкової інформації, що немов я закликаю складати зброю в нашу армію і йде евакуація. Значить так, я тут, ніякої зброї ми не складемо, будемо захищати нашу державу, тому що наша зброя – це наша правда. Наша правда в тому, що це наша земля, наша країна, наші діти, і ми все це будемо захищати. Ось і все. Ось це і є те, що я хотів вам сказати. Слава Україні! As you can see, it's a terrible traffic of Ukrainian cars. We cannot leave our country because of the uh, Russian invaders. You see, uh, we are here, we are, we are staying here for a long time, maybe uh, maybe six or seven hours, hours already, but it's, it, 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 it's, it's crazy. It's crazy traffic. I don't know how to leave my native country. Actually, I don't want to leave my, my native country, but because of the invaders, I must leave it as fast as possible.
Thousands of Ukrainians attempting to flee their country are stuck in a queue of traffic stretching at least 20 kilometers from the Polish border through the Motsyaka district as invading Russian forces press deep into the country. Already on Thursday, the UN Refugee Agency warned that 100,000 people had been displaced inside the country and on Friday said it, uh, large numbers were fleeing into neighboring countries. More than 50,000 Ukrainian refugees have fled their country in less than 48 hours, a majority to Poland and Moldova, according to Filippo Grandi in a tweet. Many more are moving towards its borders, he said, offering heartfelt thanks to the governments and people of countries keeping their borders open and welcoming the refugees. And Russia is expected to veto the UN Security Council resolution on Friday that deplored in the strongest terms the country's aggression against Ukraine and demanded the immediate withdrawal of its troops. Take a look. Ooh persevere tonight Russia you cannot veto this resolution you can veto this resolution but you cannot veto our voices you cannot veto the truth you cannot veto our principles you cannot veto the Ukrainian people you cannot veto the UN Charter and you will not veto accountability. Colleagues, President Putin has launched a massive invasion of Ukraine. His aim is to remove its government and subjugate its people. No fog of war is thick enough to obscure a truth this clear. This is not self-defense under Article 51. It is naked aggression. It is an unprovoked, unjustified war. China once always forms its own position on the basis of the merits of the matter at hand. We believe that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states should be respected and that the purposes and principles of the UN Charter should be jointly upheld. We welcome and encourage all efforts for a diplomatic solution and we support the Russian Federation and Ukraine in resolving the issue through negotiations. At present, faced with a highly complex and sensitive situation, the Security Council should make a necessary response. At the same time, such a response should also be taken with great caution. All actions should be truly conducive to diffusing the crisis, rather than adding fuel to fire. Last night was the most horrific for Kiev since, just imagine, 1941, when it was attacked by Nazis. Last night was attacked by someone who pretends they are fighting with neo-Nazism. Therefore, I'm not surprised that Russia voted against. Russia is keen on continuing its Nazi-style course of action. The Kremlin regime should not be called Russian regime. The Kremlin regime should be called Russist regime. A couple of hours ago, my president said, and I quote, tonight the enemy will use all the forces at their disposal to break our resistance, while cruel and inhuman. Tonight they will storm. We must all understand what awaits us. We have to persevere tonight. The fate of Ukraine is being decided right now, end of quote. We just heard, do you remember how many times he said that and uh, his deputies said in this very room that there will be no invasion, no attacks? Do you remember how during the previous session he was moving, walking out of uh, the chamber, trying to call someone, not knowing what was going on. How we can trust you? How we can trust your assurance? You have no idea what is on the mind of your president. But what may stop the war is unfortunately the bodies and thousands of bodies of Russian soldiers that will be delivered to their mothers in Russia whether you like it or not, because we have to defend our territories, we have to defend ourselves on our territory. 
This was this, stated by the President of Ukraine, that we are open to negotiations on a permanent basis, and we have been saying that all along. It is you who killed Normandy 4. It is you who killed the Minsk agreements. Meanwhile, Russian Ambassador Vasily Nebenzia accused the draft sponsors of spinning tales about the true situation in Ukraine, including Western allies' attempts to cover up the fact that they had been flooding the Donbass with weapons. Again, let's listen in. I will not respond to those who just accuse the Russian Federation of abusing uh, the veto right. Well, the main reason for our negative vote is not the fact that there is that what is included in the draft, but what is left out. What was left out was the way that the Ukrainian authorities, with the encouragement of their Western patrons, consistently and cynically shirked their responsibility to implement the Minsk agreements, the linchpin of which was direct dialogue with the residents of the country's east. At the same time, what was positioned on the line of contact, the deployment of Ukrainian death squads, quad squads comprised largely of radical neo-Nazi battalions, methodically, day after day, shelled the residential areas of DPR and LPR, killing women, children, and the elderly. And incidentally, this is ongoing today. Just today, four civilians died as a result of the actions of the Ukrainian armed forces. And how can we fail to mention the blood-chilling crimes by the Ukrainian nationalists as perpetrated over the past eight years, the fact that the protesters against Maidan in Odessa were burned alive, the fact that peaceful protesters in Maidan were shot at by unknown snipers. Parenthetically, I cannot but note that at the height of propaganda, our colleagues very frequently use imagery from Donbass, brandishing them as alleged consequences of the so-called Russian aggression in Ukraine. A mention today by the British Broadcasting Company, the BBC, having issued an article, Ukraine conflict, many misleading images have been shared online. The permanent representative of the United Kingdom, I would note that what you are portraying as what uh, alleging that a Russian military aircraft uh, military pieces are uh, targeting civilians. I saw the reports today, and I would like to report that this you can see from the videos that this is a heavy tank uh, 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 piece, which is called Str uh, uh, Strela 10, Ar Arrow 10. And this is in the possession of the Ukrainian armed forces. The Russian military does not have this kind of equipment. They are obsolete. This is the kind of fake uh, pieces of information that you are using. Our U.S. colleagues, I would note that uh, this, with respect to, to the alleged bombing of the kindergarten, that too is fake. Of course, it is difficult for us to uh, compete with the United States in terms of the number of invasions uh, uh, targeting their neighbors. I will refrain from uh, listing out the aggressions carried out by the United States in their history, but you are in no position to moralize. Meanwhile, speaking to journalists after the session, Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez stressed that we must never give up. Take a look. The United Nations was born out of war to end war. Today, that objective was not achieved. But we must never give up. We must give peace another chance. Soldiers need to return to their barracks. Leaders need to turn to the path of dialogue and peace. Today, in Ukraine, despite growing operational challenges, the UN is scaling up the delivery of life-saving support, including in the eastern part of the country, on both sides of the line of control. Humanitarian needs are multiplying and spreading by the hour. Civilians are dying. At least 100,000 Ukrainians have already reportedly fled their homes, with many crossing into neighboring countries, underlining the regional nature of this growing crisis. The United Nations Charter has been challenged in the past but it has stood firm on the side of peace, security, development, justice, international law, 
and human rights. We must do everything in our power so that they prevail in Ukraine, but they prevail for all humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary General, are, are you concerned about Meanwhile, Russia said now it is bombarding Ukraine's military infrastructure with air and sea-based cruise missiles. Again, let's listen in. Сегодня ночью вооруженные силы Российской Федерации нанесли удар высокоточным оружием большой дальности с использованием крылатых ракет воздушного морского базирования по объектам военной инфраструктуры Украины. As you can see here, a high-rise apartment block was hit by a missile overnight in Kiev as fighting rages between Russian attackers and Ukrainian forces. Emergency services said the number of victims was being specified and that an evacuation was underway. They posted a picture online of the tower block with hole covering at least five floors, blasted into the side and rubble strewn across the street below. Kiev Mayor Vitaly Klitschko wrote online that the building had been hit by a missile. He said in a video that the night had been difficult with Russian sabotage groups in the capital, and he insisted there were no regular Russian troops in Kiev, but said they were trying to enter from several directions. Meanwhile, a Kremlin spokesman said President Putin was ready to send a delegation to Belarusian capital Minsk for talks with a Ukrainian delegation, but the United States swiftly dismissed this offer. Take a look. That Moscow engaged in a pretense of diplomacy. That was before the invasion started. Uh, now we see Moscow suggesting that diplomacy take place at the barrel of a gun uh, or as Moscow's rockets, mortars, artillery target the Ukrainian people. This is not real diplomacy. Basement as uh, fighting uh, rages, fighting reaches the streets of the capital. Ukrainian soldiers were uh, have repulsed a Russian attack in the capital. The military said Saturday after a defiant President Zelensky vowed his pro-Western country would not be bowed by Moscow. And here are images of empty streets in Ukraine's capital, Kiev, following an overnight assault by Russian forces. Take a look. Честно, за столько лет жизни никогда не додумала, что я доживу до такого ужаса. Meanwhile, the United States, Canada, Britain and the European Union doled out further sanctions on Russia, including against President Putin and Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. The EU foreign policy chief, Josef Borrell, called it the harshest package ever drawn up by the bloc. The bloc's foreign ministers have also added Russian President Vladimir Putin and Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov to the sanctions. And uh, let's listen in. We have listed today President Putin and Foreign Minister Lavrov. This is the final outcome of the discussion who was not finished yesterday at the European Council and has been decided today by the ambassadors and the ministers on the intense discussion that we have been taking place during this morning. We will also target those in Belarus who collaborate with the Russian military aggression against Ukraine, and we will not stop there. The UK government ordered all assets of both men frozen, while the US and Canada will also impose sanctions on the pair with Washington, including a travel ban. Meanwhile, Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Sakharova said Western sanctions against the country's president and top diplomat over its invasion of Ukraine showed Western impotency and warned relations were nearing a point of no return. She also warned that Russia's relations with the West were nearing a dangerous point. It wasn't our choice, she said 
said we want a dialogue, but the Anglo-Saxon, she said, closed those options one by one, and we began acting differently, Sakharova said, on a TV show on Russia's Channel 1 shortly before midnight. And U.S. President Joe Biden has announced severe economic sanctions to make President Vladimir Putin a pariah for invading Ukraine. Arlene Ocampo reports. U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday announces severe new sanctions on Russia, including freezing assets of major banks and cutting off high-tech exports. This is in response to what the White House called an unprovoked and unjustified attack of Ukraine by Russia. Putin is the aggressor. Putin chose this war, and now he and his country will bear the consequences. Today, I'm authorizing additional strong sanctions and new limitations on what can be exported to Russia. This is going to impose severe costs on the Russian economy, both immediately and over time. We have purposefully designed these sanctions to maximize the long-term impact on Russia and to minimize the impact on the United States and our allies. Biden emphasizes that Russian President Vladimir Putin would feel the consequences of the Ukraine invasion. We've cut off Russia's largest bank, a bank that holds more than one-third of Russia's banking assets by itself, cut it off from the U.S. financial system. The sanctions aim at crippling Russia's banking system. And today, we're also blocking four more major banks. That means every asset they have in America will be frozen. And in coordination with other countries, Russia's tech industry is also being targeted. Between our actions and those of our allies and partners, we estimate that we'll cut off more than half of Russia's high-tech imports. And will strike a blow to their ability to continue to modernize their military. It'll degrade their aerospace industry, including their space program. It'll hurt their ability to build ships, reducing their ability to compete economically. And it will be a major hit to Putin's long-term strategic ambitions. And we're preparing to do more. Putin's aggression against Ukraine will end up costing Russia dearly, economically and strategically. We will make sure of that. Putin will be a pariah on the international stage. The White House says President Biden held a phone call with his Ukrainian counterpart, Vladimir Zelensky, soon after explosions were heard in multiple parts of the country, which is sandwiched between Russia and NATO member Poland. Arlene Ocampo, Eagle News, Washington, D.C. At least 40 Filipinos have fled Ukraine's capital, Kiev, and headed to the western city of Lviv after Russia launched a full-scale attack on February 24. In a statement today, the Department of Foreign Affairs confirmed their safe arrival in Lviv, expecting the number to increase in the coming days. Philippine Ambassador to Poland, Leia Basinang Ruiz, said the Philippine Embassy, in cooperation with DFA, Office of the Undersecretary for Migrant Workers Affairs, is committed to assisting the remaining Filipinos in Kiev and in other parts of Ukraine in order to bring them out of harm's way while there is still time. A team from the Philippine Embassy in Warsaw, which holds jurisdiction over Ukraine, set up a base in Lviv to facilitate the repatriation of Filipino nationals via a humanitarian corridor established between Philippine authorities and Poland. Lviv is around 70 kilometers away from the Polish-Ukrainian border and is the main exit point for Filipinos arriving from the capital. The Philippines has so far repatriated six Filipinos since tensions escalated in the country and there are an estimated 380 Filipinos in Ukraine but uh, the DFA said only 181 have coordinated with the DFA. Facebook on Friday restricted Russian state media's ability to earn money on the social media platform as Moscow's invasion of neighboring Ukraine reached the streets of Kiev. We are now prohibiting Russian state media from running ads or monetizing on our platform anywhere in the world. According, according to Nathaniel Geicher, the social media giant security policy head on Twitter, he added that Facebook would continue to apply labels to additional Russian state media. His statement came hours after Russia's media regulators said it was limiting access to Facebook, accusing the U.S. tech giant of censorship and violating the rights of Russian citizens. 
citizens. On Wednesday, Facebook also released a feature in Ukraine that allows people to lock their profiles for increased security. Using a tool the company also deployed after Afghanistan fell to the Taliban last year. And Tokyo residents took part in a worldwide protest against Russian invasion of Ukraine. Let's listen in. ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
sa aming mga makabagong pasilidad at sistema ng edukasyon. May lalabas natin ang aking talino at mga kakayahan niya. Kahit sa munting halaga, mga kasiguro ka na makakasabay siya sa mabilis na pag-ikot ng mundo. Sa new era, karamay mo kami sa bawat hamon. Kaagapay mo kami sa bawat hakbang. Kasama mo kami sa bawat niti at tagumpay. Mula noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. Welcome back. Huge downpours unleash decades-high floods in eastern Australia today, killing uh, two people overnight as the rising waters inundated homes and roads and swept away cars. Take a look. It's the night time. The night time is, 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 is frightening because you can't see where the water is and it's pitch black around here. So my biggest concern would be this evening when we lose light. I'm still on our top of our driveway. Um, as you can see, there's quite a torrent there. We got evacuated last night. I was stayed in the caravan. Very scary, very noisy. With Gympie expected to exceed the major flood level and exceed levels that have not been seen since February of 1999. It appears that the flood might be the biggest we've ever had. So that's quite likely to be, you know, in excess of 18 metres. Um, that will bring it into town for sure. And uh, this building here that we're in, the last time it flooded like that, it was up to the ceiling. So. It's going to be pretty horrific. This is a serious event. Uh, it is a life-threatening event. Just water everywhere you looked and then the creeks around us, like a U-shape, and it's running really fast. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, well, my husband doesn't swim. My lovely little car was only a year old. It hasn't had a scratch on it. I was so proud. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. Now, authorities in the eastern state of Queensland issued 11 emergency alerts in 24 hours as the death toll from days of flooding rose to four with two more people missing. The water snatched the car of a team of four emergency services workers who were heading to rescue a family from their flooded homes, according to State Police Disaster Coordinator Steve Golchewski. Elsewhere, another man's body was found overnight, bringing the overall Queensland flood toll to four after two deaths earlier in the week. The emergency services.
services responded to more than 1,800 calls for help in 24 hours in southeast Queensland, according to officials. More than 250 people were in evacuation centers as of Saturday morning. Heavy rain also hit state capital Brisbane. Rescuers undertook 132 rescues in swift water conditions in 24 hours, according to Greg Leach, Queensland Commissioner for Fire and Emergency Services. Meanwhile, rescue teams in Indonesia were searching Saturday for six more people still missing after a strong earthquake rocked Sumatra Island a day earlier, killing at least eight people now and injuring dozens, according to an official. The 6.2 magnitude quake hit the island's north at a depth of 12 kilometers, minutes after a less violent tremor Friday morning, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, displacing thousands. It damaged hundreds of homes and buildings, including mosques, schools, Schools and banks forcing terrified residents to evacuate and shuttle loved ones to safety and temporary shelters. At the moment, the search is ongoing for six people we predict have been buried by a landslide, according to Abdul Muhari, spokesman of Indonesia's National Disaster Mitigation Agency, in a statement on Saturday. At least 86 people were injured in the quake, with 10 suffering serious injuries, according to the BNBP. More than 6,000 people have been evacuated in Sumatra's west. Pasaman and Pasaman City, Indonesian Meteorological Agency BMKG warned people to stay away from slopes over fears of landslides at the peak of the rainy season. Authorities in West Pasaman have declared a two-week state of emergency while the search and relief efforts continue. The tremors were felt as far away as Malaysia and Singapore. A crack has widened in the San Rafael Glacier in Chile's extreme south and a 10-story iceberg crashes into the lake by the same name. This is a dramatic reminder of the impacts of global warming. Take a look. El cambio climático ha tenido como consecuencia en, en la región de Patagonia un incremento significativo de precipitación, de temperatura y un detrimento significativo de precipitaciones, tanto sólida como líquida. ¿ya? La, esto ha tenido como consecuencia que tenemos menor acumulación de nieve en la zona de acumulación de los glaciares y eh, un, un desbalance en los balances de masa. Por lo tanto, los glaciares están retrocediendo con esto. Peor, todos los días es peor porque el glaciar está retrocediendo. Piense que de verano está perdiendo 13 centímetros al día de capa de hielo. Y de invierno está perdiendo entre 2 y 3 centímetros. O sea, no hay vuelta para atrás. In pandemic news, uh, Rome's uh, Latium region says it is suspending collaboration with Russia over the Sputnik V COVID vaccine, which involved helping with testing and funding due to the invasion of Ukraine. 
And Sweden made the right decision not to impose a lockdown early on the COVID-19 pandemic, but should have introduced more measures earlier, according to a government-appointed commission. The uh, Scandinavian country made headlines early on in the pandemic by not introducing a lockdown, instead issuing recommendations on home working, social distancing, and good hand hygiene. In comparison with the rest of Europe, Sweden has come through the pandemic relatively well and is among the countries with the lowest excess mortality over the period 2020 to 2021, according to the commission, writing it in its final report. In other news, the officers and members of the Society of Communicators and Networkers International, or SCAN, in Sacramento, California, commemorated its 32nd anniversary. Here's MJ Rocario at the scene. SCAN International is celebrating its 33rd anniversary here in Northeast California in the hose in Sacramento. SCAN International of the Church of Christ celebrates its 33rd anniversary with special gathering in Northeast California in the local of Sacramento. On February 18, 2022, followed by socializing at the function hall. Well, the importance of SCAN International is like the motto of SCAN, saving lives is our motto. And not only lives, we also save the lives of our brethren and other people when it comes to Judgment Day. That's the importance of SCAN. We have, and we have 26 locals in Northeast California, and we set all those schedules to help other people or the needy people. We to watch over all the brethren while they're attending worship service. Uh, saving lives is, uh, is our priority. Uh, it's very important uh, because uh, SCAN organization, uh, which is, uh, it means uh, society of communicators and networkers, we usually basically, uh, we help the community in needs of calamities, uh, such as uh, storm, uh, flood, earthquake. So we're here to, uh, to uh, make sure and ensure the, the security and safety of uh, our members inside the church and non-members. Many enjoyed the socializing at the function hall playing darts and photo op at the photo booth. Saving lives is really the priority of SCAN International. And Jericadia reporting, we live in the first time. The National Hot Rod Association welcomes racing fans back to the drag strip at the Auto Club Raceway. This is the 62nd annual Lucas Oil NHRA Winter Nationals opens the 2022 season with head-to-head -head clashes between dragsters capable of going from 0 to 100 in less than a second and reaching speed stopping 300 miles per hour. In Pomona, California, our EBC Los Angeles team with this story. nitrous guzzling bone jarring action returning to thrill nhra fans familiar drivers and crews report to the auto club raceway at pomona with a few of them rolling out changes for the new season one such team to do this comes from toyota racing this is our uh, debut race with it here in pomona we uh we did some preseason testing with it earlier the beginning of the year in florida then we ran last week uh, in phoenix with it and Ran some really good numbers in preseason testing. One of my best runs at 3.86 seconds at over 334 miles an hour. For those that aren't familiar with a, a Nitro Funny Car, 
They produce upwards of 11,000 to 12,000 horsepower, so zero to 330 plus miles an hour in 3.8 seconds. So I like to think that we now have the world's quickest and fastest Toyota GR Super. As a kid, I always drove dragsters all the way up until, you know, my, uh, my late 30s, basically. So all those characteristics you learn, and then you hop into a, a funny car, which is shorter wheelbase, heavier, the engines in front of you, they don't have as much downforce as a dragster. It just, it takes a whole new uh, drive driving style that I basically had to kind of relearn how to drive again. You've got to be more aggressive with the steering wheel at times compared to the dragster because they're so much longer. But they are harder, I think, and challenging, but at the same time, they're a whole lot of fun. Not that dragsters aren't fun, I just think that the Ds are totally different and I enjoy the, the challenge that they bring. People always ask me, you know, what my daily driver is, do I have some sort of hot rod? But once I got that GR Super, it's nice to just cruise in. I just recently moved to Florida, so I like cruising along the beach and that thing, you know, and like getting people, like I said, waving to you, thumbs up and stuff like that. So when this thing goes 330 miles an hour, I want to go home and just relax and not, not be in a hurry, you know? For a drag racer, being in a hurry is measured at hundreds of miles per hour in less seconds than you can count on one hand. Sometimes you get in the, in the car and you're just really calm, cool, collected, and sometimes you get in the car and you just have adrenaline running through you. There's a lot of just different situations that arise throughout the year of, you know, between qualifying and testing and racing and then final rounds and depending on who you're racing. And so there, there's a lot of things that go on throughout the year. I mean, obviously it's a great feeling to go 330 miles an hour and accelerate, you know, zero to hundred in less than a second, six Gs. It's a pretty incredible feeling. A lot of races are separated by thousands of a second. So in our sport, uh, there's there's no do-overs. So everything matters uh, from the time you hit the gas, to the time you shut the car off. Every turn of the wheel is just ways to slow yourself down. So you really try to be as smooth as possible and as quick as possible. And when you're separated by thousands of a second, one one false move or one bad move or one mechanical error will cost you the race. This team's a great team. You know, the, the DHL crew has, has been together for a couple years. We've had a couple little changes in the off season brought in a couple people that we feel can really help the organization. And then obviously with uh, Toyota Gazoo Racing, we have a lot of support from them. We have crew chiefs on between the DHL Funny Car, DHL Dragster, and the Mac Tools Dragster. Of, uh, they relay information back and forth. So there's a lot of brain trust that goes on and a lot of information that gets passed throughout the, the three teams throughout the day. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's one big team. And uh, you know, hopefully we're able to accomplish some big things at the end of the year. It's a little different from the last couple of years. I mean, so it's, it's obviously good to get everybody back out, get everybody back out to the races, enjoying it, and having a beautiful day out here, and get back to what we love, and that's watch fast race cars, and, and for us to go fast. Going fast is the name of the game for both seasoned pros and junior drag racers looking to be the future of the NHRA. We're having the juniors display our cars, as you can see, to just spread the word about junior drag racing, and brought in the whole program. Our cars, it's very, very consistent. So if we want to turn 790, it'll run like 790 or anywhere around that. Makes like mid 50 horsepower. I'm pretty sure it's like 500 cc's. It's crazy, it goes fast. I wanted to change the car to be more me, but everyone started complimenting how nice it looked, how sparkly it was. And then I seem to fall in love with like the orange and the gold and the sparkles and the flames. So now it just became a part of me. Like orange is now one of my top favorite colors. If you look like all the cars are blue or white, my car's different and it pops. The 62nd annual Lucas Oil NHRA Winter Nationals kicks off a drag racing season, which when experienced in person, creates a markedly different kind of sensation. When you're in the stands, you feel the rumble underneath you and you, and you, you feel the power. And that's that's a part of the, the attention draw that I think a lot of people come back is because of that. And being able to come into the pits and see the driver, see the crew, see them tear apart a motor, uh, you know, down to a bare block, put it back together in an hour and fire back up and go out there and make another run. So they're, they're able to stand behind us when we warm it up and they're able to smell the nitro and get a little bit of that burn of the, the nitro sensation. So like I said, it's the atmosphere that, that's what sells the ticket. Once 
we hit the throttle with 11,000 horsepower. It's like a small earthquake, you know, for, for those that haven't been out here, like you see him jump off the ground almost. It's a, it's a pretty cool experience. I've never seen someone come out here for their first time and say they didn't enjoy it. You know, they, uh, they always come back and tell their friends. And that's what it's all about. And the road between season opener and the championships in November is a long one. But as long as there's engine roaring, smoke billowing driving, and drag racing fans are more than up for it. Evan Allen, Eagle News, Los Angeles. As always, I'll end the day on a thoughtful note. Our ability to look back and smile at our past is proof that God's plan is to keep us moving forward. This has been Eagle News International. I'm Alma Angela. Stay alert and stay informed because we live in interesting times. Good night. necessity to ultimate must-have fashion accessory. Yan ang